Autolite and its 98,000 dealers bring you Mr. Peter Lawford in tonight's presentation of Suspense. Tonight, Autolite presents a classic study of suspense, a new dramatization of one of the most terrifying stories ever written. Wilkie Collins, A Terribly Strange Bed. Our star, Mr. Peter Lawford. So wonderful is a day in June. Why, world-famous Autolite spark plugs, of course, Hap. What? I said world-famous Autolite spark plugs are tops, Hap, because they're ignition engineered, designed and built by ignition experts to give the best performance money can buy. That's why Autolite spark plugs are specified as original equipment on many leading makes of our finest cars, trucks, and tractors. But what do spark plugs have to do with June? Why, Hap, June is the perfect time to get your car tuned up, to get the spark plugs checked for summer driving. So, friends, see your Autolite spark plug dealer soon. He's a specialist on spark plug cleaning and adjustment for all makes of cars. And if replacements are needed, he will install ignition-engineered Autolite spark plugs, either resistor or standard type, best suited to your car and your style of driving. Remember, from bumper to tail light, you're always right with Autolite. And now, Autolite presents Mr. Peter Lawford in Wilkie Collins' story, A Terribly Strange Bed. Hoping once again to keep you in suspense. Shortly after my education at college was finished, I happened to be staying in Paris with an English friend. We were both young men and lived, I'm afraid, rather a wild life in the city of our sojourn. And thus had probed the various refined pleasures suitable to our class and searched for others less elegant. Search for them in the neighborhood of the Palais Royal which lies covertly against the dark river Seine. And from each closed doorway, the small echoings of small promises. (laughs) That one in there. That doorway there. Oh, you're drunk, Gerald. Pleasantly, exquisitely, modestly, delicately am I drunk. And therefore... Therefore what, Gerald? The doorway I have suggested and the word Frascati painted on it. Noble word, noble mystery. I've been there. Oh, sly, sly, sly and traitorous friend. You have been there, and alone, slyly and without me. And it has a ghastly kind of respectability. Five franc respectability, and it would would not not amuse me. me. Come along, Joe. Come along, Joe. Hmm. Well, sit, Joe, you're coming along very nicely. What I want, Joe. Oh, what you want, Henry. Once and you shall find once and you shall find. What I want is somewhere where we can see a little genuine blackguard, poverty-stricken gaming with no false gingerbread glitter thrown all over it. No gingerbread for my friend. Thank you, sir. A place not fashionable, not respectable. A place of evil, perhaps. And of emotions I'd never know. Oh, Gerald, come along. Gerald will not come along. Gerald is content here. Listen to me. Gerald is content here to lean his weariness and his search against this doorway. Against... (laughs) Gerald! (laughs) The door flung open behind him, and Gerald had fallen flat on his back. And for a while, laughed. Then, with my help, got up. And Gerald laughed no longer. For the room, the gaming room, was tragedy. Mute, weird tragedy. And the quiet in the room, horrible. And the people of the room, a thin, haggard, long-haired young man whose sunken eyes fiercely watched the turning up of the cards and never spoke. The flabby, fat-faced, aspiring player who registered on a pasteboard how often black one and how often red and never spoke. The dirty, wrinkled old man with the vulture eyes and the darn greatcoat who had lost his last sou and still looked on desperately and never spoke. The voice of the croupier. Red and black. Make your best. Red and black. The voice of the croupier, dull and thick in the atmosphere of the room. We had entered on a laugh, but the spectacle before us was something to weep over. I'd found it. The pleasure I searched. I'd found it. Henry. Yes? Your eyes. The look in them. Yes. <laughs> it's what you wanted, isn't it? The place of evil and of emotions you'd never... I want to play. Well, of course you do. Come, then. Red and black, make your bet. Red and black, your bet. Red and black, your bet. A thousand francs on black. (laughs) 
Black. Black wing. Leave it. All of it black. Henry. Wait. Black. Black wing. Leave it. All of it black. Henry. Yes. A passion in you. No, no, not a passion. Idle amusement. Yes, only amusement. Wait. Black. All of it. All of it red. This time red. Oh, not passion then. Intoxication, perhaps. Yes, intoxication. As I have never known it, intoxication. Yes. 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 Which has become... Red. Red wind. All of it red. And ten thousand more. Oh, which has become passion. Which has become passion. Red. Red wind. Now, the black croupier. Black. Oh, uh, permit me, sir. Uh, permit me to restore to their proper place the two coins which were dropped. <laughs> there, in their proper place. A thousand francs. <laughs> A tall man, and quite fat, pinched into a frogged and braided surto. A man of goggling, bloodshot eyes, mangy moustaches, and a broken nose. And the dirtiest pair of hands I ever saw. Yet, in the mad excitement, his look, his hands, held no repelling influence on me. For now, in the mad excitement, in the reckless triumph, I was ready to accept even such as he. What wonderful luck is yours, sir. I pledge you my word of honor as an old soldier in the course of my long experience in this sort of thing. Never, but never have I seen such luck as yours. Thank you. Ah, go on, sir. Boldly, handsomely, break the bank. I assure you, sir, I have every intention... Do it then, sir. Go on, break the bank. <laughs> my gallant English comrade, boldly, break the bank. All of it, black. <laughs> And I did go on. Went on at such a rate that in an hour... Gentlemen, the bank has discontinued for tonight. In an hour, in an hour of a kind of ecstasy I'd never known, all the notes and all the gold in the bank now lay in a heap under my hands. The whole floating capital of the gambling house under my hands, waiting to pour into my pockets. No. No. No? Uh, no, not in your pockets, sir. Uh, for no breeches pockets whatever sold could hold such heavy winnings. Well, then how... Uh, may I take your pocket handkerchief, sir? Uh, thank you. Ah, tie it up, sir. Tie it up in your handkerchief, as we used to tie up a bit of dinner in the army. <laughs> yeah, shovel it in. Uh, now then, sir, two tight double knots each way with your permission. Ah, and the money's safe. Thank you. Feel it, feel it, sir. Hard and round, hard and round as a cannonball. Feel it. <laughs> <laughs> ah, champagne, sir. I will buy you champagne. No, thank you. I... Well, for your friend, then. Yes, for Henry's friend, then. <laughs> Amiable, gracious Englishman. Mm. Champagne. Champagne for the friend of the conqueror of the bank. And for me. Ah, come, sir. Uh, to my table. <laughs> I am Fabian Nero, gallant sir. And you? Henry Calder. And this is my friend, Gerald Titchener. Henry, Gerald, Fabian. <laughs> lovely, lovely, lovely. <laughs> Henry, Gerald, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> Henry and Gerald. <laughs> Fabian. Hey, we are friends, aren't we? Who have <laughs> touched your sleeves to have you seated here beside me. <laughs> this old soldier's heart will burst. My eyes will weep. My hands will... Ah, <laughs> the champagne. <laughs> yeah. Ah, a toast, gentlemen. A toast to... Not for me, please. Oh, oh of course not for you. Uh, Gerald and I, then. You wouldn't Gerald, Fabian. <laughs> a toast to the goddess Fortune, who embraced tonight our Henry and smiled secretly upon him and nestled very close. The goddess Fortune, gentlemen. An English cheer. Hurrah, 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 hurrah. Ah. Hurrah, hurrah, hurrah. <laughs> hurrah, hurrah, hurrah. <laughs> 
Maybe I'm quickly enough. Yeah. Gerald, you were tipsy before. Now you'll... Henry, not to permit the golden blood of France to flow through the veins of this vivacious Englishman. And Gerald, your friend. Oh, shame, <laughs> shame. <laughs> Drink, Gerald. Uh, toast to France. To present company, to the croupier. And the croupier's wife. And the croupier's daughter. <laughs> the croupier's daughters. <laughs> and the ladies elsewhere... And to ladies... I should uh, like coffee, Fabian. Uh, uh, coffee? Coffee. For me and for Gerald. For intoxication... Well, and... coffee it shall be. Uh, coffee. Coffee for the darling of fortune. Coffee. The word pronounced by Fabian Nero seemed to have a magical effect on the company present. They suddenly had lost interest and, and all rose to depart. Probably they had expected to profit by my intoxication by the proffering of champagne. The finding I would have none of it had now abandoned all hope of thriving pleasantly on my winnings. Whatever their motive might be, at any rate, they went away in a body. And the silence of the floor was now deeper than ever. Then, from a sort of vestibule at the far corner of the room, a woman appeared, bearing a tray of coffee and glasses, and walked towards us, enveloped in silence woman of emaciated face and burning bright eyes and wisps of colorless hair drifting across her rouged cheeks. Your coffee, sir. Thank you. You will find it strong and good. Thank you. Strong and good, handsome, sir. Here you are, sir. Thank you. For I am parched with thirst. And it was kind of you and of Fabian and gracious and generous. How wise you are, Henry, to drink this coffee of Millie's, the coffee of Millie Prudhomme. Millie Prudhomme. Divine Millie. Beautiful Millie Prudhomme. Oh, mm. handsome, sir. Will you have coffee? No. Champagne, Millie. Ah, to drink of beauty. <laughs> How wiser than your friend, Gerald. To drink coffee and rid yourself of your little amiable exaltation of spirit before you think of going home. And you must, my good and gracious friend, oh, for with all that money... Good and gracious friend. With all that money to take home tonight, it is a sacred duty to yourself to have your wits about you. Drink, Henry. Drink your coffee. You are known to be a winner to an enormous extent by several gentlemen present tonight who are but mortal men, sir, and have their own amiable weaknesses. <laughs> Drink, Henry. Who'd surely rob and murder if you were to... Wait. Wait. Oh, yes, I'm ill. I'm very... What? He is ill. Very ill. I will weep. Henry is ill and I am drunk. Millie will sob. Will you sob, Millie? Ill. Bit of giddiness. The room whirls round and round. Furiously. Henry! Your voice deafens me. Furiously! Oh, my dear friend, my dear friend. Madness to go home in your state you could be robbed, murdered. You need a walking and then a sleep and not a murdering. A walking and then sleep and in a safe place, Henry. Yes. Yes, walk. Sleep. In a safe place. The place of Millie Prudhomme. A rooming house above the game room. And the capital beds of Millie's rooming house. I don't... Madness to go to your own home. Sleep at Millie Prudhomme. And tomorrow. Tomorrow. Go home safely with your winnings. Tomorrow. In full flow of life. And in broad daylight. Tomorrow. Gerald, Fabian's right in If anyone needs sleep, you surely need it. Come then. Quickly. Come then, quickly. I will help you. Put your arm about me. That's the dear boy. Really? <laughs> really. <laughs> yes, Gerald. <laughs> Come. Here, Henry, here. The choicest room of Millie Prudhomme. The capital bed there. And the tasteful furnishing. And the deep sleep to be had. And the safe one. Till tomorrow, Henry. I don't know how to thank you. Oh, you have thanked me enough already with the exaltation of your splendid company. 
and that I could have been of some small service to your small malady. <laughs> oh, Millie. Oh, let me go, Gerald. <laughs> oh, handsome, sir. <laughs> oh, come, 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 Millie. Henry wants his seat. Oh, the vibe, Millie. The vibe. Oh, Henry, is it... Oh, Henry, is it... Millie Proudhon, she... <sighs> Gerald passed into his particular oblivion in the middle of a sentence. I walked over and locked the door. Then I took my money, my winnings wrapped in a handkerchief, and placed beneath the pillow of my bed. I lay down. My senses still swam, and I looked up at the heavily brocaded canopy, and it seemed to move. Somehow to move. And for an instant I thought, this was a terribly strange bed. is bringing you Mr. Peter Lawford in Wilkie Collins' A Terribly Strange Bed. Tonight's presentation in radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. Well, hello, vacation time's nearly here. Yes, Hap, but not for spark plugs. They're the very heart of your car's ignition system. And if they're not right, the chances are you won't get smooth and efficient engine operation during summer's hot and heavy driving. That's why now is the time to check them, eh, Harlow? Yes, Hap. And when replacements are needed, wise drivers insist on ignition-engineered Autolite spark plugs, like the famous Autolite resistor spark plug. That's the amazing double-life spark plug that gives top performance for twice as long as ordinary spark plugs. And the Autolite resistor is only one of a complete line of Autolite spark plugs designed for every use. Right, Harlow? Right, Hap. So, friends, see your Autolite spark plug dealer tomorrow for a spark plug checkup. And if you need replacements, take nothing less than ignition-engineered Autolite spark plugs, either standard or resistor type. You'll be glad you did because, from bumper to tail light, you're always right with Autolite. And now, Autolite brings back to our Hollywood soundstage Mr. Peter Lawford, in Elliot Lewis's production of A Terribly Strange Bed, a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. I could not sleep. Restlessness took me over and I got out of bed. There was the dim, quiet flicker of a single candle, and next to it a washstand. I plunged my face into the water. There was a single chair, and I sat down and tried to compose myself. Slowly, slowly, the giddiness left me. A shutter. And a window. Shutter attached by a single hinge and flapping against the side of the house. And no lock on the window. No way of locking the window. Henry. Gerald. Gerald, are you up? Uh, where, where? Where? In a room. Over the gaming place. It's all right. I've locked the door. But the window... It... Window. And there's a window. Listen. Did you hear? Mm -hmm. I was wide awake. And every one of my senses seemed to be preternaturally sharpened. Piano and a song I had never heard. And then behind it... The laughter. Wide awake, yet somehow the effects of whatever drug I had drunk seemed suddenly to arise again. And for an instant, toy with my perception, so that I reached for the wall to steady myself lest I fall down. Leaned against the wall for support. The quality of the evening music and the youth from England... The moment their voices wavered and fled, a kind of melancholy seized me. 
I walked over to the window and looked out. Looked out upon blackness, a swarm of blackness. No shape definable could be made out through the gloom, except a lighter grayness of a sort. As if an abutment of some kind, I suppose. Directly across the window and somewhat below it, but how far across and to what lengths below, I could not determine. For all purposes then, I knew only that we were above the street level in some three stories. And having felt the walls directly adjacent the window, I found them to be sheer. No one could enter there. I walked over to the bed and took a pillow and placed it beneath Gerald's head. The bed again, and I lay down. This bed that now I was lying upon, I must again describe to you. A four-post bed with a regular top line with chintz. The regular fringe balance all around. It was ridiculous now that I tried to sleep. I couldn't even close my eyes. I resolved then to beguile the tedium of my wakefulness by making inventory of every article of furniture I could see. Window, washstand, chest, chair... Dressing table, picture. Upon the wall opposite the bed, a picture. A fellow in a high Spanish hat crowned with a plume of towering feathers. A swarthy, sinister ruffian, looking upward. It might be at some tall gallows on which he was going to be hanged. Such was the picture. Another chair, candlestick. Picture. It seemed to be moving. The hat had been pulled over the eyes, and there... The hat itself was gone. The hat was gone. The plumes, the... Was the bed moving? No. No, it was a brief and terrible dream. How could the top of a bed move? A brief and terrible dream. Trick of the eye and the mind's going down for a moment into sleep. Yet... Yet I let my mind say it. The top of the bed had moved. Gerald. Gerald, wake up. Uh, huh? Open your eyes. Uh, now, now what? Shh, quietly. Keep your voice in a quiet tone. What, why? Why? What? what, what? Shh, listen. <laughs> above you. Directly above you. Look, there's a picture. Do you see it? Yes. Yeah. A minute ago, the man was wearing a hat. Ah, he was wearing a hat. Now he is not. Oh, my friend, you're very drunk. I'm very proud of you. You fool. Oh, listen to me. Why, then? Where there was a hat is now a peephole, and we are being watched. All right, Henry. Now stay where you are, but be alert. All right, Henry. Henry. Yes. What are you going to do? Make sure of a thing. What thing? The bed. What? Keep your eye on the canopy. I'm going to lie in the bed now, Gerald, and make sure that they're not trying to murder us. How? By feigning sleep. What? By feigning sleep, Gerald. Just that. Now, quiet. Yes. Now, I am constitutionally anything but timid. I have been on more than one occasion in peril of my life. And I have not lost my self-possession for an instant. But when the conviction settled on my mind that the bed top was actually moving, it loosed a feeling within me foreign, laced through with terror. So I lay there, motionless, speechless, breathless. The candle spent went out, but the moonlight still brightened the room. I lay there. It descended. The whole canopy came down. Close down. Henry. I lay there. Henry. Literally spellbound by what was happening. Out of bed. But once I could not tell whether reality was here or my imagination was taking hold. Quicker before they... Closer. Closer. Henry. Gerald's voice shattered this warm sea of fascination that bound me and I... Leapt from the bed. Look. Look, Henry. Yes. There. The middle of the bed top. The huge wooden screw. Like a press. To smother me and relieve me of my winnings and then kill you. Carter, open. Unlock the door. Open. The light of the morning, Gerald. Carter. And look. It comes yes. up and through the window, across the open. narrow shaft. Another building. We can leap it. Not I. What? No, no, not I. My legs are still unsteady. If I should stand up on that sill, I'd fall into space. Then wait. And hurry. Yes. Hurry. Hurry. The rest of my 
my story is soon told. From the building next door, I reached the ground and saw police. With them, I returned. And Mr. Fabian was seized, as was Mrs. Prudhomme. The police congratulated me on my good fortune and Gerald's on his, and told us that they would probably never know how many people had been smothered in this diabolical bed. So tightly was the canopy pressed to the bed that I could not retrieve my money. The me mechanism had to be released from the room above. The police bade us go, and finding ourselves walking homeward, Gerald said to me, I know a place where gambling is carried on at such a fever pitch that you will be carried to the heights of excitement. Needless to imagine, I refused to go along with Gerald. My adventure cured me of ever again trying Rouge et Noir as an amusement. The sight of a green cloth with packs of cards and heaps of money on it will henceforth be associated in my mind with the sight of a bed canopy descending to suffocate me in the silence and the darkness of the night. <laughs> Suspense, presented by Autolite, tonight's star, Mr. Peter Lawford. Here are the results of the great $100,000 Autolite family charity drawing. Over 5,200,000 entries were received for this event. Last week, the final drawing was held in New York under the supervision of a distinguished committee. Here are the names in the order of their selection. $50,000 will be distributed to the charity or charities designated by Desi L. Irish of Vallejo, California. $20,000 will go to the charity or charities designated by Lucille Foisy of Miami, Florida. $5,000 to the charity designated by Vincent W. Sisler of Howe, Indiana. $3,000 to the charity designated by Stuart Smith of Ogdensburg, New York. And $2,000 to the charity designated by L.G. Bridgewater of Kennewick, Washington. These people and 20 others who will each designate $1,000 to their favorite charities have all been notified. And now this is Harlow Wilcox wishing you a summer of safe driving with the reminder that wherever you travel, from bumper to tail light, you're always right with Autolite. Next Tuesday night, June 15th, we will continue with a new series of suspense programs. At that time and through the summer, we hope that you will join us and that we will be able each Tuesday night to keep you in suspense. Suspense is produced and directed by Elliot Lewis, with music composed by Lucian Morrowick and conducted by Lud Gluskin. A Terribly Strange Bed was adapted for suspense by Morton Fine and David Friedkin from the story by Wilkie Collins. In tonight's story, Ben Wright was heard as Gerald, Paula Winslow as Mildred, Joseph Kearns as Fabian, and Vic Perrin as the croupier. Peter Lawford may currently be seen co-starring in the Columbia picture It Should Happen to You. And remember, suspense continues on Tuesday night beginning next week, at which time we will present... The earth is made of glass. You can buy Autolite standard or resistor type spark plugs, Autolite stay full batteries, and Autolite original service parts at your neighborhood Autolite dealers. Switch to Autolite. Good night. This is the CBS Radio Network.